bringing sexy back with those dance moves. I'm Mike Farrington, welcome back to my shop, aka The Boardroom. In this video, I'm going to show you how I go about building the easiest wainscoting you're ever going to build in your entire life, and I guarantee you that. So I get started by picking up a couple of sheets of 1 quarter inch MDF and 1 8 inch MDF. After unloading, I break everything down to size, and in the industry this is called panel processing. And they call it this to make themselves sound cooler than they actually are. Once the panels are all cut to size, I draw everything out full scale. And I like to do this for two reasons. One, I like to see the project full size just to make sure that I'm happy with the proportions. And two, it allows me to check against my measurements to make sure that there's not going to be any interferences with light switches, outlets, or plumbing fixtures. So after I draw everything out, I actually cut full width pieces and I use them as rulers. So this piece here is nine inches wide and I'll use this to draw the bottom line for all three panels. And this just ensures that my layout is consistent. Just to give you some dimensions, the bottom piece was nine inches. That's the top, it's four inches. The outside two pieces are four and a half and the middle ones are four inches. And also keep in mind there's going to be a five inch tall base molding and these panels are going to be mounted one half inch off the ground. I really like to take my time and make sure the layout is done right and is accurate. If I'm going to make a mistake in this project, I'd like to do it at this stage. And here's the finished result and drawing out a couple of these when you have those full width rulers goes pretty quick. Notice the white stuff on the roofs of these houses. It's the end of May when I filmed this and we just had a massive hailstorm that blew through. With the layout complete, it's time for some cutting. And a track saw really makes quick work of this. And I'm certainly no fanboy of Festool, but they do make some really functional, really good tools. Um, I bought this track saw before the other companies started making track saws. I think if I was going to buy a track saw today, I might look at a couple of the others. But if you have the money, these are really useful tools that get a lot of work done and quickly. But if you don't have a track saw and you don't want to get one, that's really not a problem. You can use a regular circular saw and an edge guide, or you can use a router with an edge guide or a router with a flush trim bit. At this point, I'm sure you've figured out what I'm doing, and that is I'm just cutting openings in one continuous piece of MDF. This really has one main advantage, and that is there's no joinery. And no joinery means that there's no clamping, and also when you paint the panels, there's no chance for a seam to show through. And this method works best when the walls are less than 8 feet long. If the walls are longer than 8 feet long, you'd have to butt joint two pieces of MDF together, and that would kind of turn into a nightmare. Some places do sell 10 foot MDF, and if that's the case, then go for that if your walls are less than 10 feet. Also, I'd just like to mention that I'm using quarter inch MDF here, but I've used this same method uh, all the way up to three quarters of an inch thick. And for this project, I chose to use a one eighth inch back and a one quarter inch panel. And the reason I did that is the casing that exists in the bathroom that this is going to be installed in is five eighths of an inch thick. And I wanted the wall paneling to step back a little bit from the thickness of the casing. After cutting as far as possible with the circular saw, there was still a small tab left to cut with a handsaw. And a sharp chisel will take care of any leftovers. And last but not least, some sandpaper to remove any saw marks. And here I'm sanding the backs with a 150 grit sandpaper. 
and I'm doing this just to make sure that the primer has some tooth to stick to. After sanding, it was time to glue these suckers together. And you know what? I'll admit it. My method for clamping the panels together was a little immature. But in my defense, this was a Saturday and we were going to be hosting a barbecue at our house. And I think at this point my wife was yelling at me to be done working for the day and to get cooking. So this was the fastest thing I could come up with. And the panels came out dead flat and the glue joint was nice and tight. So it all worked out. And for the second go round, I decided to cut the cover sheet down so that I could clamp everything to my workbench. At this point, the panels were clamped and drying, so I decided to turn my attention to the chair rail that will finish off the top edge. Anytime I'm making molding in-house, I like to make the pieces as short as possible. Now, I add a few inches on to the finished dimension, but I just find it easier to mill up short pieces. And I guess this goes without saying, but I always like to make a few extra pieces of molding as well. Nothing more frustrating than when you're on site, you miscut a piece, and you don't have a spare. And now it's time for pro tip. I'm cutting a rabbit in the back of the chair rail and I'm doing this so that the chair rail overlaps the paneling by about a half of an inch. And what this allows me to do is shoot a nail in the very top edge of the paneling and then cover it up with the chair rail. And this of course makes for a cleaner, faster installation. And here's the finished result. And as you can see, I've glued a few blocks in place and those blocks are there for the ends that are going to be visible. With the paneling complete and the moldings all cut out, it was time to move on to primer. Once in a while I find it necessary to completely take my spray guns apart and give them a good cleaning. And that's clean on the inside, not on the outside. So you remember earlier I mentioned that I needed to get this project done quickly because I had a barbecue to attend to. Well, we had an unwanted guest. I don't know much about snakes, but if you can identify this one, let me know in the comments section below. And this little sucker was pesky. I had to get a shovel under him, and I grabbed his tail, and I was able to pick him up that way and move him to a different part of the yard. And then about 30 minutes later, he was back, and I had to do it all over again, and this time I moved him further, and I didn't see him again for the rest of the day. The following day, after a little too much fun at the barbecue, it was now time to spray some primer. When spraying onto bare MDF, I prefer to use a shellac-based primer. And it dries fast and it sands really easily. I like to start off by spraying the inside edge, and this ensures that that gets good coverage. Then I come back and I spray two coats over top of that, and I wait about 10 minutes in between the coats. So after the two coats of primer has dried, it's time for some sanding. So when sanding primer, I think it's important to buy a sandpaper that's designed to be used on paint and sealers and that it's non-loading. Don't worry about the name so much, just that it's a non-loading sandpaper. Time for another pro tip. Here's how I like to tear up my sandpaper sheets. And the cool thing about tearing them this way is it allows you to use all of the abrasive. None of it is wasted. So I start by grabbing myself a scrap that has a nice sharp edge on it and I rip the sandpaper in half a handful of times until they are that size right there. And then I fold those pieces into thirds. And as you wear out one, you can kind of flip out the other one and it allows you to use all three of those surfaces very effectively. And one of the cool side effects of folding your sandpaper this way is it allows you to hold the piece with your middle two fingers and then you can use your index finger and your pinky finger to feel the surface as you're sanding and it lets you know exactly when you've sanded enough or if you need a little bit more work. 
After sanding, I vacuum off all the dust, and then it's time to spray some paint. And in this case, I'm using Sherwin-Williams Pro Classic, and I had it tinted to match the rest of the trim in the house. And my spraying process is exactly like before. I spray the inside edges, and then I come back and I do two back-to-back -back coats of paint. And I am spraying fairly light coats, really as thin of a coat of paint that will flow out is what I'm going for. And I'm using what's known as a conventional spray gun, not an HVLP gun. And I have independent controls over the pressure put to the material and the pressure that comes out of the air cap. And this allows me really good control and a glassy smooth surface when I'm done. So when spraying water-based paints like Pro Classic, I like to let them dry for at least a couple of days. And in this case, I let everything sit around for three days before loading it up and taking it over to the job site. I must admit, even after all these years of doing this, I get a little nervous before an install. And I always kind of second guess my measurements. And I'm always concerned I'm going to forget a tool. Usually I don't, but once in a while it happens and it is a headache when it does happen. When I'm loading up, I like to use a lot of packing blankets. And the packing blankets that I like, I get from a place called Harbor Freight. And let me tell you what, their packing blankets truly are a diamond in the rough. All right, now I'm over at the job site, and I start with the hardest panel to fit, and that's the one that's behind the toilet. And in this case, I had to take it in and out a couple of times just to do the proper notching to get it to fit nicely next to the vanity. And in this case, I was fortunate that the plumbing for the toilet actually comes out of the ground, so I didn't have to do additional notching for plumbing. I like to use lots of construction adhesive when installing paneling that's thin, and this will help keep it from rattling around if it's tapped or bumped against in the future. Really secures it to the wall and gives it a nice solid feel. So as I'm nailing this to the wall, I make sure that the nails are very near the top, and that's to ensure that they will be covered up by the chair rail that I'll be installing in a couple of minutes. In this shot, I'm not checking for level. I'm actually checking to make sure that there isn't a bow or a hump in the panel. And if that piece is installed and is nice and straight, when I go to put the next one in, it'll butt up against it very nice. I always like to install wall paneling up off the ground just a little, and I do that because I don't want to have to count on the ground for level. By lifting it up off the ground just a smidge, maybe a half inch or an inch, it allows me to kind of wiggle the panel back and forth and get it to perfect level. After installing the last panel, I realized it would be near impossible to get this one in and installed correctly with the door still on, so I went ahead and pulled that off. So as the installation moves along and you see this project coming together, I hope you would agree that this is a pretty easy and efficient way to install wall paneling. And what I really like is that there's very little touch-up and very few nail holes to cover at the end. The final two pieces on either side of the door I fit with hand saws and a small hand plane. I install the chair rail with some construction adhesive and one or two nails per piece. And I install the base molding in the same way with some construction adhesive and a couple of nails. And the base molding is just a builder grade five inch tall piece that I purchased to match the existing in the home. Once everything's nailed in place, I carefully fill the nail holes and I caulk the seam between the chair rail and the wall. And I also caulk the seams at the corners as well as between the baseboard and the wall paneling. I like to use a two and a half gallon bucket with a lid and a couple of inches of water in the bottom of it and an old cutoff from a white t-shirt that really helps in this process. And usually after I'm done with the caulking, I take the time to break down my tools and load up as much as I can for the day. This gives the filler and the caulking some time to dry and then I come back and do some touch up. 
And for touch-up paint, I use the same Pro Classic, and I add a small amount of water to help the paint flow out real good and look as close to a sprayed finish as possible. So once I'm done with my installation, the customer is going to have some wallpaper put up, which I think is going to finish the room off real nice. Let's close out here with a few shots of the finished product. Overall, I was real happy with the end results, and I'm happy that I took on this project. I think it added a nice touch of class to this bathroom, and I hope you enjoyed watching this video, and I really appreciate you following along. Till next time, thanks for watching.